Hello everybody, back with you. Let me get set up here. Welcome to Avionics Education live stream. I believe this is number four. I did three last week, or four last week. Um, if you missed them out, go ahead and check it out in the YouTube channel. Uh, like, I, uh, like I've always tried to say, and I've seen everybody who's done live streams before, I always say, if you like what I see, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and don't forget to mash that notification bell because I guess subscribe doesn't mean much. Uh, anymore. I don't have a whole lot of viewers on this channel and that's fine uh, with me. This is something that I wanted to put out there to you. To you. I saw a lot of views on my electrical connector. Uh, today I wanted to talk about something that was more uh, regulatory based. 
As most of you may know me, I am a former, a reformed FAA inspector, which is really odd because I've been in aviation maintenance for well over 40 years now. Only 12 of those I was an FAA inspector. Uh, the rest of the time, I was an aircraft avionics technician at a large airline. I worked at uh, I'm a mechanic, as an A&P mechanic, and I'm an inspector at another large airline. Uh, I did time in the Air Force. I was an aircraft maintainer. We call us mechanics at the time. And I taught at an A&P school, and I taught, most importantly, the avionics subjects and the NCAT subjects. So one of the things that came up on a Facebook posting I saw this morning, it was a technician who was an aircraft maintainer. He's currently in the Air Force. He has an A&P. And he was just asking, what do you need to know to be able to get a job? And most of the postings on the Facebook page were pretty kind, just simply saying, apply. And they're not wrong. But when I first started working for the airlines, let's see, 80s, it was 1989, I first showed up at the doorstep. After coming from the Air Force, it was a little frightening to me. They had a lot of faith in me to say, hey, you're avionics, go avionics. And my first job was to fix a radio. Not any understanding, um, at least the people that hired me didn't have any understanding of what I knew. I knew I was in avionics, I knew I worked in the Air Force, but I've never worked on a commercial air carrier jet before. I never worked on the ATA chapter system. We had tech orders when I was in the Air Force. I wasn't expected in the Air Force to look on all the avionics systems. So we had um, uh, AFSCs, uh, codes that kept us pigeon pigeonholed in certain chapters. Uh, I thought it was really ironic, the uh, realization that, hey, I saw the IFF shop next door, not realizing in civil aviation is simply nothing more than the transponder system. Um, so my first night was an education in how to read a wiring schematic, how to deal with an ATA chapter 20, how to connect an electrical connector. These are all things I wish I had uh, trained on when I first got into, into a, the airline that I started working for. And so that's kind of what was came up in the, one of the postings. Somebody said, well, learn your ATA codes and learn your MELs. And it's true. When did I learn MELs? And an MEL stands for Minimum Equipment List. And an MEL was, was something that was very important for a line technician person to really know well. And it was a process of being able to determine uh, a discrepancy in an aircraft and do whatever action it takes to make the system safe to allow the aircraft to be dispatched. This is ultimately what we're trying to do here. Uh, so we're talking about MEL, minimum equipment list, and it kind of ties in with determining the airworthiness of an aircraft. And I want to do is go back into, hello, my name is Bruce Bissett, if you don't remember who I was, and I wanted to go through and talk about this little certificate here. Um, you'll see one in every airplane, you walk on the jetway, you look in the front door, and if you look around, you should see this airworthiness certificate. And the airworthiness certificate is a promise that the owner operator of the aircraft has maintained this aircraft in an airworthy condition. So what does airworthy mean? Well, first and foremost, it's actually two conditions. One, that it meets its type design, meaning that it was manufactured by a U.S. manufacturer. If you're walking on an airliner, it's going to be a part 25 airliner for a Boeing, an Airbus, uh, an Embraer, uh, Bombardier. These are all manufactured or accepted under Part 25. If you're working on a Piper, a Cessna, a smaller GA aircraft, even smaller um, aircraft that, that operate um, jets, they operate in Part 23. Whatever the, whatever the size of the aircraft or the type of operation, they still have to maintain an airworthiness standard because they're type certification. So, that's everything that airplane came with. The day that I had its certificate signed off on, all the equipment's installed based on the equipment list of the aircraft, uh, the flight manuals put inside the aircraft, the approved, um, um, all the approved equipment's inside, the pilots are trained, and it has nothing to do with airworthiness, but, <clears throat> but the instructions are there for the pilot, all the placards are in place. That's airworthy. And then you have to put a caveat on that, or, or in a properly altered condition. Either it has to be meet its type design <clears throat> or properly altered condition. Well, properly altered is no airplane is ever the way it is when it was came out of the factory. It's modified, it's aged, it's repaired, it's fixed, uh, and which means it's altered in some way. So the FAA has a process that allows us to properly alter an aircraft. Uh, one was through an STC, 
supplemental type certification. Uh, a PMA parts uh, that are manufactured through an STC can be done. Uh, issued through Service Bolt, my manufacturer. These are all ways that we can alter an aircraft uh, after it's been uh, been uh, constructed or built and sold. Uh, the other thing we could do is we could apply with airworthiness directives. Airworthiness directives also give us uh, ways that we determine safety of the aircraft. But there's another way that doesn't seem to get mentioned uh, in in general aviation, but we can do it in air carrier all the time. Is that when an aircraft comes to the gate and the pilot puts in a discrepancy in the logbook, and let's say that I'm going to use an example here that there's a, a problem with one communications uh, channel. Uh, most aircraft have two or three boxes on it. It's a large aircraft. Well, they only really need two. So if I can maybe move the broken box to the third position, um, could I fly the airplane with that broken box installed in the aircraft? Well, in the air carrier world, we're all taught, especially for those working the line, to use the MEL list, the minimum equipment list. And I'll talk about that in a second. But did you know that general aviation pilots have the same options? Uh, when I walk up to a Cessna or Piper on the ramp, everything on it doesn't have to work all the time, as long as I do a maintenance action to address the discrepancy. And that's what we're talking about, using a minimum equipment list. So in part 91, We've got 91213, which stands for inoperative instruments and equipment. And the first thing it tells you when I read it here, except as provided in paragraph D, and we'll cover that in a second of the section, kind of kind of a prohibitive. No person may take off from an aircraft with an inoperative instrument or equipment installed unless the following conditions are met. And they have four there's five conditions here we're going to talk about. And the first one is, is there an approved minimum equipment list for that aircraft. Um, some aircraft do have approved minimum, uh, minimum approved, ah, approved minimum equipment lists. These are done by the, by the local FAA, if it's a general aviation airplane, not assigned to an air carrier. But if I'm running a part 135 or running a part 121, the principal inspectors will review uh, an, app, uh, an operator's application for an MEL uh, and we'll look at an MEL format here in a minute, and you'll sign for it. It's approved, the keyword being approved, not accepted. So if I have an approved minimum equipment list, I could take off the airplane with things broken. Uh, and this gets back to item two, if the aircraft has a letter of authorization issued by the FAA, again, except for paragraph D, uh, over the, from the flight standards, the FISDO of the local jurisdiction. So item two just says, that the letter has to be on board the aircraft if the aircraft is going to use an approved MEL. Three, the MEL must meet um, basically a standard house manufacturer. Now, the FAA on their website will have what they call master minimum MEL list or master minimum equipment list, master MELs, MMALs, uh, for various aircraft. And these were developed by, uh, by boards. Uh, within the FAA and in of course in coordination with the manufacturer to say, okay, what is safe? What is unsafe? What is installed in an aircraft? What can be left off in an aircraft? And a master cannot be used, you know, just as a blanket. Here's my master and put it in the aircraft. It's got to be tailored to the aircraft operation. And I'll show you an example of a master here in, in a few minutes. But it has, to be, uh, it has to be in a format that the FAA will approve of. Uh, provide for the operation of the aircraft with the instrument and equipment in an opera condition. It's not just that, okay, it's broken, we go fly. No, there has to be a maintenance action taken. The aircraft records available to the pilot must include an entry describing the inoperable instruments and equipment. And what, is this, what does this kind of talk about? This says if I'm using an MEL, I need to have a logbook or a maintenance record in the aircraft. And the reason why I say that is that when you work on, a, on an air carrier aircraft, there is a logbook, a maintenance record on the board of the aircraft. Um, in fact, it's used for a lot of different reasons, in, included for the pilot to, to write in the daily discrepancies, but also used to document minimum equipment list requirements. In general aviation, uh, most aircraft logbooks, there's usually three logbooks you'll have, uh, one for the airframe, one for the propeller, and one for the engine. And those aren't normally kept on the aircraft. Uh, those are usually kept with, you know, in the hangar where the aircraft's stored or with the aircraft owner or some other location. 
uh, it's just not common practice to keep a logbook in the aircraft. Now, if I'm going to operate with an approved, FA approved MEL on board my aircraft, I have to have some sort of record on the aircraft where a pilot can go up to the aircraft and review what's been MEL'd. Because ultimately, it's the pilot that has to determine the safe operation of the aircraft. And there's that other condition of airworthiness. Is it safe? Okay, item five, I'm kind of skipping ahead. I'll go back in a second. Item five, it talks about the aircraft is operated under all applicable conditions and limitations contained in the amendment equipment list and the letter authorized. What does that mean? Well, it means that in the MEL, we'll have instructions for maintenance to perform and instructions for pilots to perform as far as how they operate the aircraft. A great MEL that we had for uh, a pressurization system on a jet, on a 737, we could we had two pneumatic air cycle machines, two packs. We could deactivate a pack on a revenue flight, but we were limited to the altitude of the aircraft. We couldn't fly up above a certain altitude. Uh, and it also was a, a, a critical, we couldn't fly very long uh, in it. And it gave instructions to a mechanic to go through and deactivate safely the pack system so it wouldn't come on inadvertently. And instructions to the pilot to say, don't fly above, I think it was 18,000 feet. Under paragraph C, we're kind of going back. Under paragraph C, it says, a person authorized to use an approved MAL issued for a specific aircraft under subpart K, part 121, 125, or 135, Okay. Now, these are all talking about subpart K is what I call general aviation light, part 91. These are operations with an approved maintenance program. Part 121, part 125, and 135 are all for compensation or higher. Completely different situation here when we're talking about these MALs. Same thing for a technician working with these MALs. Um, I should be provided by my airline when I get, when I, uh, when, before I start working, that I that I've given instructions on how to read the manual and the manual the maintenance manual the instructions manual will tell me how to use an MEL. Pilots will also receive their same training. So what this paragraph says here that part 91213 does not apply to aircraft operating under 121 125 135 for subpart K because they'll have their own MEL procedure and process to comply with. And there's that D. I told you I promised I'd get back to paragraph D. And except there are all those other provisions for A through C, in other words, I have it approved, I'm not operating commercial or higher, and, um, and I have the letter on board, it says a person may take off at an aircraft in operations conducted under this part, 91, with inoperative instruments and equipment without an approved minimum equipment list provided. And it goes through the provisos. Some of these aircraft that are manufactured, they don't have a master MML or an owner chooses not to go to the FA and apply for one. You don't have to. Under paragraph D, under this rule, under uh, 91.213 paragraph D, it says as long as I'm operating in a rotorcraft, a non-turbine powered aircraft, a glider lighter than air, and or weight shift care for which a master minimum equipment list has not been developed, or all these aircraft where it has been developed. So it's up to the aircraft owner to where if I'm operating a light aircraft, let's say a 172 or a 182 or a Piper PA-25, even though there may or may not be a master list approved, I'm not required under the regulations to go get a master MML and then go take the master and then convert it into my own and go get the FA approval. That's not what this says. This says under certain conditions, I could still operate an aircraft with inoperative equipment, but I could choose to have a, a, a formal MEL or not. So we keep on going, and it talks about paragraph second. Now, it says we can take off with inoperative equipment, and then we have provisos here. We always have if, remember, we're always talking about safety, and these are the provisions. It says the inoperative equipment and equipment are not, keyword being not, part of the VFR day certification requirements and equipment prescribed in the applicable airworthiness regulations under which the aircraft was type certificated, meaning under rules of part, part 23, part 25, there's going to be a list of equipment that these aircraft are required to have for basic minimum VFR flight, right? Every aircraft's got to get a compass. Can't MEL the compass. Every aircraft has to have an altimeter. 
at least one altimeter. Can't, can't MEL all of them. There's only one of them. Must have an airspeed indicator, a pressure indicator. There's a whole list of instruments that must be on board the aircraft that are not allowed to be an operative to go fly the aircraft. And the other rule talks about it in here. It says indicated as required on the aircraft's equipment list or on the kinds of operations equipment list for the kinds of operation being conducted. So what are we talking about here? On this particular section in paragraph II, it, it says that if a manufacturer says that I've got a piece of equipment installed, it's not a minimum VFR part, but the manufacturer says, mm, for this airplane to be safe, you must have it on and operating, then that's something that would not be eligible to be put on an MEL list or be put in the logbooks as being uh, being deferred. Uh, III, triple I, says required by 91205 or under the rules for the specific kind of flight being operated. It just talks about... Um, I'm going to use an example. If an aircraft is being operated in controlled airspace, I can't leave my transponder at home unless I, I pay in a waiver. And the last one is required to be operated by Air Weather Directive and or other FAA approved, uh, FAA approved requirement or mandate. Um, you can't uh, minimum equipment and something that is a safety of flight item. By definition, an airworthiness directive is, a, is a information to an aircraft owner to let them know that an unsafe condition occurs, which means that if I have to install a piece of equipment to, go, to make the aircraft safe again, I can't disable it to fly. So we go in under paragraph three again of the same section. The inoperative instrument equipment R, there's R, I can remove it from the aircraft, I can, I can placard the cockpit control, and and the key word here is there must be a maintenance record put into the logbook saying 43.9 of this chapter or, I'm going to talk about 43.9 in a second. What is 43.9? Well, if I have an inoperative equipment on the aircraft, that means that there has to be a discrepancy. <clears throat> if I'm operating in part 135 or one, uh, 121, for example, in a carrier, we'll have specific instructions for the pilot to say, hey, if there's a discrepancy, they write it in the logbook now. <clears throat> the pilot, the operation side, has done their part. The next part is a mechanic has to, has to deal with the discrepancy, and that's what we're talking about here. I don't have to fix it, but I do have to address it, which means I need to make the aircraft safe for flight, which means either remove the affected part, uh, placard the cockpit control. 439 just states that I'll write in the logbook, removed part, placarded in accordance with, right? And I'll, under 439, I'll say the date the work was done. I'll say um, a brief description. I'll talk about uh, the person returning the aircraft to service and my, uh, my number and, and uh, certificate type, right? And under OR, there's another OR here talks about OR, deactivated and placard inoperative, quote, if deactivation of the improper, ah, let me repeat it. If deactivation of the inoperative instrument or equipment involves maintenance, it must be accomplished and recorded in accordance with part 43 of this chapter. And we'll get to the and part here in a second. Um, the question is, if I put a placard on an instrument panel, how am I performing maintenance? And I, if I had students here, I'd say, anybody, anybody? And I said, it's a placard. Well, technically, when I put a placard on an instrument panel, right? That is a change to the aircraft's type design. It's particularly to its flight manual. Then any change to the flight manual needs is considered, can be considered a major alteration requiring a data entry. So yes, a simple placard is a maintenance instruction. It has to be done by an appropriate certificated individual under part 65, which means a mechanic or uh, a repairman if it's an avionics uh, item. Keep on going, paragraph four, here we go. This is the part that I think is really important. So now, the aircraft comes in with a discrepancy, the mechanic says, oh, you don't need this. Um, we sign it off, we put a placard on it, and we pull the circuit breaker and tag it. We do everything we say to say, it looks good to me. And the pilot comes up to the airplane and says, nope, I'm not taking it. Well, guess what? They don't have to. Because remember, it says right here under item four, a determination is made by a pilot who is certificated and appropriately rated under Part 61 of this chapter, or by a person who is certificated and appropriately rated to perform maintenance on an aircraft, that the inoperative instrument or equipment does not constitute hazard to the aircraft. 
and then it gets on, it gets further than rule. They don't have to fly the aircraft if they feel that the operation would be unsafe. And uh, we have to. I need to be real careful here because when, for example, a landing line, some large aircraft will have four of them on the front. You've seen them, right? And one of them goes out. Okay, go to the MEL. Says four installed, three required. Fantastic. Change it. And you MEL, you can't change it, but you MEL it, defer it, put the affected switch, make the logbook entry. But the aircraft now is going to be operating in bad weather, or it's going to be operating at night. The pilots determine, oh, I need all four lights, especially if you're going into an airport that's poorly lit. The pilot can make the determination to where if it was day VFR, it would be safe to fly with that piece of equipment and operative. Let's say the pitot heater, right? If the pitot heater is broken, if it's day VFR, does it have to work? Um, but if it's raining or at night, then it would, that same situation would be, it, that condition would be unsafe. And I'm picking on pitot heater because I think there's some aircraft that says you have to have it uh, VFR or not. So the pilot gets the determination if the aircraft is safe. And it says an aircraft with an operative instruments or equipment as provided in paragraph D of this section is considered to be in a proper altered condition acceptable to the administrator. So that's it. If I have an MEL, I've addressed the MEL according to, this, according to the instructions of the MEL, I have properly altered the aircraft and the aircraft continues to be in an airworthy condition. See how easy it is? So let's talk about what it looks like. If I want to come up with an MEL for my operation, let's say either part 91, or if I want to come up with it in part, uh, part 135, uh, for a 172, for example, um, let me belay that. Under part 91, let me make sure you just stick on part number one. There is an advisory circle out there, I could use 9167, that'll help me to develop an MEL if I, if I choose to. And we'll get into the, to the conditions here of exactly, exactly four, but let me delay that. It says on the first paragraph of this advisory circular, it says it right here, if you go through and look at it, it says, in accordance with 91, 123, 125, and FAR 135, and then there's a little caveat here for what they call single pilot operation, uh, and 135, 419. If I'm operating compensation higher under 121, or um, for uh, that's larger 10 or more, this AC does not apply. So we are talking about a general aviation, an owner wants to have an MEL. You tell the instructions how to get a letter of a letter of authorization, an LOA. So the FISDO will issue an LOA to the operator when the FISDO authorizes the operator to operate under the provisions of an MEL. That means this is that letter I told you about in the regulation. It says it has to be on board the aircraft. Included in the letter will be instructions on how to use the MEL and when it's appropriate. Okay, so together with the LOA, the procedures documented and it talks about the paragraph. And the master MEL constitute a supplemental type certificate, STC. The operator must carry the STC and the aircraft during the operation. And it gets back to my question about putting placards on the panel. Isn't that doing a major alteration in the aircraft requiring approved data? Approved data is a supplemental type certificate. An MEL is an STC, uh, which, which means it has to be approved in the aircraft by the FA. So let's talk about real quick. If I have, uh, I want an aircraft, I have, in this case, we talk about a Beach Model 200. The FA does provide on their website a master MEL for a lot of different aircraft out there. All you have to do is go to fa.gov, type in master MEL or master minimum equipment list, and you'll find a listing of all the master lists that came up. Uh, it could be my, by make and model, it says here. So here's an example here that talks about the latest revision it was put on, and it talks about where it came from. In this case here, we've got a Cessna aircraft, a 208, 208A, a 208B, and it talks about who developed it, and it's and you're going to use the most current revision of this, in this case, revision 7. And they all have the same exact format. The issue is that you'll see the master and minimum equipment list. Um, you'll say it's issued by the Department of Transportation. It says master MEL at the top of the header. It gives you the aircraft, and it, it has the, the, the revision number. Now, on the header, when you apply it for the FA for an LOA to use a master minimum equipment list, please do not leave this header on. You're going to put your name and you're going to put 
the name of the minimum. So you'll say minimum equipment list for November 123 X-ray. So it will be your name, no longer Department of Transportation, Federal Aviation, because you're applying as the aircraft owner operator for an MAL, and you'll assign it to an aircraft by N number. Uh, and they would leave the rest the same because you could use the same page number. It is, uh, for the most part, I've seen these things as PDF and Word documents, and they're editable. And your job as the aircraft owner working with your mechanic is to go through these items one by one. Now, all of them will be listed in the ATA number system. So if I have the electrical power, uh, electrical power system, here I've got a, a chapter ATA, chapter 24, electrical power. Um, it's 01... Uh, uh, system 1001 for a standby alternator. If the aircraft's equipped with a standard al standby alternator, okay, it may not. Uh, same thing, if there's an avionics inverter, and that's chapter 2201. If you do have a piece of equipment that's not listed on here, but you want to include it in MEL, type it in. Uh, let's say is that when these uh, master lists were created, the avionics uh, today that came about weren't, probably didn't even exist. So let's say I have a second Garmin display and it doesn't come up on my master equipment list. I've got one, I'm sorry, excuse me, I have one installed, but I have other alternative for navigation. Could I include it on the list if it's not included in the master? And the answer is, of course you can. You put it in there. Uh, of course, a Garmin is a navigation unit. Uh, uh, the uh, GPS would be a navigation unit, Chapter 34. And I've had some fights with other FA inspectors. They also say it's Chapter 23. Uh, and that's true because it's an all-in-one unit. It does meet Chapter 23 communications and is Chapter 34 navigation. And some people uh, have gotten away with uh, uh, isolating the functions within the box. Uh, Garmin doesn't like that so much. But uh, you could try to get it, try to ask the FAA and says, hey, the column doesn't work, but I can use it for navigation. Again, you'd have to explain in the comment section how exactly you're going to ensure safety. The next column coming up is repair category. Now, this was established when you look on the master MEL, that was established by the people on the, uh, the MERB, the maintenance review board that established the MELs for that aircraft. And they put them in category A, B, or C, A being the most critical um, B and C being less. For an airline that I used to work for, for example, uh, a category A MAL was basically one flight, the next flight you fly it. Uh, another airline may be to the next night. Uh, it just depends on, on how they do it in their manual system, where B would be so many cycles or so many flies and C is so many calendar days. Um, in the airlines, we could get extensions or waivers. In general aviation, we generally don't see that column even being used. Uh, we don't have time limits on our MELs in general aviation, um, but in the world of air carriers, uh, it'll be part of the CAMP program as far as, and part of the ops, on the ops manual too, as far as how long these manuals, or how long these MELs could be on an aircraft before they have to be addressed. So, but in the master MEL, they have the recommended recommendation category. Moving along, that's an important column right here. This talks about the number installed. That means the number installed that you'll see on the equipment list. And then the number next to it is how many you have to have for dispatch. So in my example here on the standby alternator, if there's one installed, it says right there, I don't have to have any uh, for dispatch. Down below, I've got an avionics inverter. Uh, these are for non-G1000, which is uh, non-glass uh, non cockpit systems. Um, you'd have number installed were two. I could, I could dispatch an aircraft with one of them in up. So we could have a number of uh, a number installed and, and the number required zero. If it becomes one and one, it'd be unlikely you'd actually see this on the, uh, on the uh, master MEL. There would never be one installed, one required. The whole point of this thing is it's a minimum equipment list. If you see one installed, one required, they just take the item off the list. And the last block is instructions. And instructions that come in two flavors. It's going to have a M instruction and it'll have an O instructions. An M instruction is a maintenance instructions. It'll be information provided to the maintenance technician to determine what am I supposed to do with this. Um, for example, on the standby alternator situation, it says may be an operative provided. A, aircraft is not operated in known or forecast icing conditions. <coughs> and the flight is not an IFR, FAR 135 passenger carrying flight. Uh, so condition A says, yes, I could fly it, 
as long as I'm VFR only, carrying passengers, uh, or not going to be flying into icing conditions without passengers. Uh, there will also be a O issue, which will apply a limitation to a pilot. Now, in this particular example, we don't have any instructions for a standby alternator because usually pilots don't don't have a maintenance or have a an operational action. But if you have a, a pack, for example, an air air cycle machine that doesn't work, then of course, yeah, the pilots would have instructions to say, hey, do not operate above whatever altitude, as I mentioned before. So under that uh, FAR 91213, instruments and equipment required by an airworthiness directive to be in an operable condition unless the airworthiness directive provides otherwise. So this gets back to what I was talking about before. If it was an airworthiness directive that caused that part to be installed in the aircraft, you cannot put it on an MEL list. No matter how hard you try, it will not be allowed. In fact, as when I was an FAA inspector, that's what I did. I went through and did an AD check when I was reviewing uh, an MEL, and I determined if uh, I would first find out what parts were installed in the aircraft under MELs, or at least had M, uh, some components would have MELs assigned to them. And again, instruments and equipment required for specific operations by part, part 91. At that point, what they're talking about in paragraph three <clears throat> is operations under IFR, instrument flight rules. You'd have minimum equipment required for instrument flight rules. Let's talk about this under section three. Uh, in operating instruments and equipment removed from the aircraft, copy control placard and the maintenance recorded. We talked about this before. Uh, your choice. Most pilots don't remove the parts from the aircraft. I have seen, uh, for example, if I do have an instrument in the instrument panel, um, if you remove the instrument from the instrument panel, the issue is, what do I do with the hole? Because uh, I'm going to go through, and, and if I do choose to remove that from the instrument panel, um, I have to put a backing plate on it. And then I put the placard on the missing on the missing gauge or dial at that point because the pilot needs to understand. Um, well, that was something that 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 if it's missing, I could fly the airplane in some other way. Most of the time, I don't take very many parts out of an aircraft with an MEL. Uh, placarding a switch, uh, meaning you put down a switch and off, and then put in op next to the switch or control, or or and. Uh, pulling a circuit breaker and applying a collar to the circuit breaker. Uh, I also will tell mechanics, please do not ever, ever, ever use a zip tie on a circuit breaker um, to deactivate it. The problem is, is that zip ties are freaking strong. Circuit breakers are incredibly weak. And the stress that you put on one to cut the, the uh, zip tie off, it's amazing how it pops the head right off that circuit breaker. So only used the appropriate circuit breaker collar, and you should have spares in the aircraft, uh, to be able to lock out or deactivate a system. So if the MEL instructions say that you need to lock out a system by pulling a circuit breaker, then part of the equipment list or part of the required equipment on the aircraft will be circuit breaker collars to be able to tag it. And there we go. Deactivate and placard inoperative if deactivation of the operative instrument or equipment involves maintenance must be accomplished and recorded in parts 43 of this section. So you just kind of want to try to push that for you and say, hey, that's very important. Um, a pilot can write up an aircraft. It takes a mechanic to, to at least return it to service or clear it for return to service. And, um, of course, a pilot always has that ability to make the ultimate decision. Uh, for example, when I talk about doing a maintenance sign-off, I am approving the aircraft to return to service. It still takes the pilot to actually accept the aircraft is safe for flight. Whether it's just the pilots that's taking the airplane up, we just approve it as a maintenance action. And that's it. I want to imply that. An aircraft with an operative instrument or equipment has provided in paragraph D of this section is considered to be properly altered condition acceptable to the administrator, which means the aircraft is in an airworthy condition. Uh, I did ask later on, before I let you guys go, I did ask for uh, questions uh, about this subject. I had a great one from, uh, from a person who says, well, what if I have an inoperative equipment and I have an annual coming up? Does the equipment have to be repaired for the, at the annual? And uh, the answer to that, actually, if you talk to a couple different NFA inspectors, you might get a couple different answers. But I'll give, you the, I'll give you the answers that we had talked about when I was in Oklahoma City, one of the academies. And the answer is, it's not an it depends. 
it is, are you signing the aircraft as being airworthy? So since general aviation does not normally have a time limit on how long these uh, equipment can be uh, MEL'd, because uh, remember, it's the pilot's going to determine that, <clears throat> that, that operating the aircraft with this piece of equipment in active and operative is a safe condition. We don't have that requirement in general aviation like we do in air carrier, which means that if it comes up to the next annual inspection, as long as the IA addresses the situation, okay? In other words, the IA sees it as a discrepancy and the discrepancy is properly placarded and the system is safe, <clears throat> then the IA can say that the aircraft remains in an airworthy condition. I have found the aircraft to be in an airworthy condition because it was properly altered. Now, again, I've gotten into arguments with other FAA inspectors says, no, 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 it's got to be, re it's got to repair it at annual. And if you look for the tent of the rule and you look back at the preambles, it says no such thing because they don't have time in uh, in operative. Again, if it's not a VFR required minimum equipment item, or if it's not required for a particular operation for IFR, for example, or flying into controlled airspace. Remember now, ADSB is online after 2020. Uh, and I want to talk about that coming up in another video, talking about, well, I've got this ADSB equipment, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, uh, now involved in equipment. Uh, I know I have to do my transponder certified uh, certification every 24 months. What about my ADSB equipment? Is there continuing maintenance for that? And I'll cover that on another video, not as a, as a live feed. Uh, so remember, check your equipment list to see if it's something that's, that's safe for flight or if it could be uh, installed. But otherwise, um, gosh, this is number five. I hope everybody is staying safe out there. Um, I looked at the president's briefing this morning and he said that we are day 10 of 15 of our, of our time of uh, separation. Um, I hope we get through this sooner than later and everybody get back to work and get back into the air. So, hey, thanks for, thanks for attending and until next time, we'll see you then.